Thank you. Okay. So this is a quote from the paper, Neural Episodic Control by DeepMind researchers. So they say, the glacial learning speed of deep reinforcement learning has several plausible explanations. And in this work, we focus on addressing these. So deep learning is slow. And when I say that it's slow, I don't mean computationally necessarily, but I mean it's data hungry. It requires thousands, if not millions of examples to learn something that a human might learn in only a few examples. Um, and this is in fact such a well-known problem that there's a whole area of research dedicated to it, sometimes referred to as few-shot learning or uh, one-shot learning. And the question is, why is it so slow? Why can't we just increase the learning rate so that it learns sufficiently quickly? Well, when you do that, you get catastrophic forgetting or catastrophic interference. And if you're not familiar with what that means, uh, catastrophic interference means that as you learn new concepts, you forget older concepts. So you, es you essentially end up overriding the weights uh, as you go along, that the, all the things that you've learned before. So in, uh, neuro, in neuropsychology, they separate memory into a few different categories. So you have the human memory system, which they subdivide into short-term memory and long-term memory. Long-term memory is subdivided into implicit and explicit memory. And then the category that is, that is of interest to us is explicit memory, which is subdivided into semantic and episodic memories. And of course, uh, episodic memories are the inspiration for episodic control. So episodic memory, what it means is it's about individual instances of things and people and events, whereas semantic memories are um, generalizations of abstractions. So it's, for example, uh, an episodic memory might be remembering the name and breed of your first dog, whereas a semantic memory might be knowing that a bulldog is a dog breed. So semantic memories are general abstractions uh, that can be derived from uh, episodic memories. Okay, so episodic control is a uh, reinforcement learning framework. So it tries to solve the problem of reinforcement learning. And it does so specifically to try to address the slowness associated with deep learning. So the way it works, uh, in episodic control, we have a, a key value store or a dictionary. And for each possible action of our agent in its environment, we have associated with that a, a state reward dictionary where the keys are the state vectors and the uh, values are the rewards that were associated with taking that action in that state in the environment. <clears throat> so once you have this data structure, which is the memory in which you essentially store all state action reward tuples, um, you, to choose the optimal action, what you do is you go through each possible action, and for each action, you do a lookup in that dictionary of the current state of the environment. So it's a K nearest neighbors lookup and based on the state vector. So you keep those K nearest neighbors. From those, you compute similarity scores. And with the similarity scores, you use that as a weight in a weighted average on the associated rewards. So from that, you essentially estimate what's your expected reward for taking that action in that state of the environment and you repeat that for each of the possible actions, and you keep the action that maximizes the expected reward. And of course, there's always a need for exploration, so you can use any exploration heuristics like uh, epsilon greedy or something like that when you need to do these exploratory actions. So this simple approach is called model-free episodic control. And it's, it's discussed in this paper, uh, Model Free Episodic Control by DeepMind. I think it was released in 2016. Um, yeah, so I will share the slides so you'll have access to all of the links that I will provide. Something to note is 
when the environment is sufficiently complex that it's a very high dimensionality state vector, you might want to use a dimensionality reduction layer. In the MFEC paper, they try, they discuss two different dimensionality reduction mechanism. The first one is random projection, and the second one is using a variational autoencoder. So you start from a very complex, let's say, or high dimensional state vector from your environment. You pass it through this layer of, of dimensionality reduction, and you get a state embedding that, it, that is of a much more manageable dimension. Okay, so what are some problems with model-free episodic control? The, so the first problem, in my opinion, is that it might overfit if you don't have enough data. So it will, for example, if you only have, uh, let's say, three samples for a given state and a given action, because let's say it's a rarely visited state or you're just starting the simulation, um, it will use that as if it were a thousand samples. In other words, you cannot derive a, a statistically robust estimation from three samples, but it will give you an estimate from that, and it will not distinguish that from something that is much more certain, like using 2,000 uh, 2, samples or something like that. Uh, so the second thing is that this uh, state representation that you use and the dimensionality reduction meta parameters all of those are essentially statically handcrafted. They don't automatically adjust to be optimized as you go along. And we'll get back to that very soon. Uh, the third problem, which is very much related to the first one, is that it doesn't know what it doesn't know. So like I said, it will use a reward estimate based on 10,000 samples, and it will use a reward estimate based on three samples, and it will treat those two as essentially the same thing. Okay, so enter neural episodic control, which is a paper that came up, I think, last year. So this addresses problem number two. So the idea that the dimensionality reduction layer, the state representation is static and handcrafted, this will make it more optimal and it will learn essentially on its own. So how does it do that? It introduces a differential, differentiable neural dictionary. So a differentiable neural dictionary is a dictionary similar to the one we just discussed in model-free episodic control, but this state reward dictionary is differentiable end-to-end. -end. So it, maybe it's implemented with TensorFlow or something like that. And what that means is that the actual rewards that you obtain, you can then compare them against your previous predictions, and you can use that error, that prediction error, as gradients for backpropagation. And this backpropagation will update the weights of the dimensionality reduction layer that produces the state embeddings that you used for doing a lookup. So visually, what it looks like you have your environment on the left that produces a raw state vector, and then you feed that to your dimensionality reduction layer. Um, in the neural episodic control paper, one of the differences is they use a convolutional neural network rather than a random projection or a variational autoencoder. Um, that produces a state embedding you use that state embedding to do what we discussed earlier. So we look up in the dictionary that state embedding for each of your actions. You calculate a similarity weighted average or expected reward, and you use or you apply the action that has that maximal expected reward. So this is the main action loop, if you want. But in neural episodic control, compared to model-free episodic control, there's this extra step where you're going to be learning so you're going to use the estimates versus the actual rewards as gradients in a backpropagation mechanism, which will update the weights of your dimensionality reduction layer. So in neural episodic control, essentially there are two levels of learning. There's the fast episodic learning that occurs also in model-free episodic control but there's also a slow gradient-based learning which optimizes the state representation for episodic learning purposes. 
So in a sense, the role of the gradient-based learning level or layer is to select what features of the raw state vector are important, how do you prioritize them with respect to each other, and so forth, in order to indirectly optimize the lookup mechanism, right? So you're not operating on the lookup mechanism. The lookup me mechanism is just this similarity weighted average, but because the input to that lookup mechanism is a state embedding, then by optimizing the mechanism that creates those state embeddings, you're optimizing the lookup process. So as a result of that, as the neural episodic control agent learns, it also learns how to represent the state embeddings in a more efficient way to get more accurate estimations of the rewards. So how well does it do uh, compared to other techniques? This is uh, a table taken from the neural episodic control paper. Um, they essentially, they compare on 57 Atari games. And in the table at the top, they take the median scores across those 57 Atari games. At the bottom, it's the mean scores across those 57 Atari games. And you can see, if you look, let's say, at the top one, the median scores, you can see that the neural episodic control is, so from 1 million frames, so each row is a certain number of frames for which the simulation has run. So if you look at 1 million frames to 20 million frames, the neural episodic control dominates over, well, model-free episodic control as well, but clearly also on various variants of the uh, DBQ learning and also of A3C. Um, but after, so starting around 40 million frames, you can see that all of a sudden, um, DBQ learning with prioritized replay starts dominating. And of course, as you go forward with more, more frames, uh, deep cue learning takes over. So what we can conclude from that is that episodic control, or neural episodic control more specifically, is the king of the low data regime. But of course, as you get more and more uh, samples to learn from, deep cue learning takes over and becomes more accurate. So here are some links if you want to play with model-free episodic control, neural episodic control. I found those on the web. Now, they're, none of those are like production quality or anything like that. It's just if you want to have a look. OK. So now that you're all experts on episodic control, I'm going to talk about some of the research I'm doing, so some of some ideas I'm looking into. Uh, so all of this is like a work in progress. It's nothing that's peer-reviewed or anything fancy. So Maybe it's all nonsense what I'm going to talk about, so you be the judge. Um, so this, what I'm trying to do with this is to address the point number three that I mentioned earlier, which is that model, well, episodic control in general doesn't know what it doesn't know. So it will take um, an estimate from, let's say, three data samples, and will attribute to that the same value as if it were from a thousand samples. And this is what I'm trying to address here. So the idea is that this reward, this reward function from the environment, so this mapping from an action in a state to a reward can be thought of as a normal distribution if we simplify things. Now, you, of course, you could think of it as something more complex, but to keep things simple and tractable, I use a normal distribution. Um, so. It assumes also, when I do that, it assumes that there's a bit of randomness in the environment. It's not a purely deterministic environment. In other words, repeating the same action in the same state will not necessarily give exactly the same reward, so it will vary a little bit, hence this normal distribution. So this reward function has a mean, and it has a variance or standard deviation. So two parameters to estimate the uh, reward function. But there's also your own uncertainty as to your estimation of these two parameters. Um, and this uncertainty comes from lack of evidence and from prior beliefs. So if you look at, so these are the posterior distributions from uh, estimating on a certain data set, which we'll, well, which we'll discuss about later. 
Um, so at the top is my estimate of the mu parameter, so the mean of the distribution. It estimates as its best guess 0.25, but you see that there's a very wide variation in, its, in the possible values of the true parameter, okay? So this is because in this example, I'm using three samples to estimate a distribution, okay? Now, the other at the bottom is the estimate of the standard deviation, which is around 0.15, let's say. And again, the variance is very large because I'm only using three samples. So now we have two concepts. We have one that I call risk, which is an inherent variance in the reward function that is intrinsic to the environment. So this uh, variation cannot be reduced with more evidence. It's really part of the underlying phenomenon. Whereas there's another concept, which is uncertainty, which is a variance in your posterior belief or posterior distribution about that parameter. But that is related to how much we know and how much we don't know. So the more evidence you obtain from the environment, the smaller that variance becomes. So this is uncertainty. Um, and as, um, as the number of samples that you obtain approaches infinity, this uncertainty approaches the objective variance in the underlying distribution. So that's a standard result in Bayesian estimation. So the uncertainty converges to the real variance of the distribution as you approach an infinity of samples. But that's a detail. So the question, I'm gonna ask you a question essentially, is it better to choose an action with a high expected reward, but not much evidence or a very high risk? Or is it better to choose an action with a slightly lower expected reward, but a much higher uh, uncertainty and much less risk? Uh, sorry, much higher certainty and much less risk. So to put that question into perspective, let's say that you're going to be investing in a mutual fund, all of your life savings, and fund manager A tells you that they expect to make 15% a year, but there's a 2% chance that you will lose all of your money within the next 10 years. Fund manager B tells you that they'll only make 8% a year, but you can reasonably expect to lose no more than 30% of your money. So which would you choose? Um, I don't know about you, but personally, I would choose fund manager B because even though there's less reward, there's a much lesser risk of a big loss. And in general, um, uh, tradition, conventional investment professional advice would tell you to choose um, fund manager B with the lower reward because in finance, it's really all about risk reward ratio. So for a certain increment in profit, you want to have a limited increment in risk. Um, now, so that's what I would choose, but conventional reinforcement learning agents, including episodic control as we discussed it so far, will choose A because standard um, reinforcement learning maximizes the expected reward. It has no notion of risk or uncertainty. And because in this one, fund manager A provides a better expected reward, this will be chosen. So this is the notion of risk averse behavior. And uh, I would argue that it's not just a thing that's limited to finance, but I think that in general, in the everyday world, we tend to think in terms of a very risk averse behavior. So let's say that a child touches a stovetop element and gets burned. Is she going to touch it another 100 times to make sure that in a statistically robust way, on average, she will get burned? Probably not. The, the risk reward ratio is not there, right? So the, like the, when the stakes are high in the real world, we tend to be very much risk averse. We don't care so much about a long-term notion of expected value. We care more about how much can I get hurt, right? Okay, so how would I implement something like that? Um, so similar to model-free episodic control and neural episodic control, I have a dictionary, I query the state in that dictionary, and I get uh, samples from uh, rewards, 
And what I do here that's different is I estimate a normal distribution on that. So it goes back to what I, fir what I first mentioned where I model the reward as a normal distribution and I try to estimate the uh, mean and standard deviation parameters of that distribution. And I do that with Bayesian estimation, which allows me to have a notion of uncertainty that's built in. And so we want to know what is the risk and what is our certainty about these estimates for each possible action. And the idea, as we discussed, is that we're going to choose the action that not only maximizes the expected reward, but also minimizes risk and uncertainty. And I call this conviction-based conviction action. Uh, so this is what I came up with as a formula to estimate this notion of conviction. Now it's a very simple idea. There's probably a smarter way to formulate this, but for now that's what I have. So we essentially take the expected, uh, the expected mean of this reward, which, we, which is what we're trying to maximize, and we divide that by the standard deviation of our estimation of the mean, which corresponds to the uncertainty in our estimate, multiplied by the expectation in the standard deviation parameter, which is the notion of uh, objective risk. And so in practice, what happens when you do that? I have a bit of a proof of concept code to get an idea of what it does. So here what I did, what I implemented in that proof of concept code is uh, three reward functions. So you can think of this as three different possible actions in a uh, same, so in a current state of the environment, which we don't change. And the idea is, which action do I choose? And I uh, generated data for each of these actions following different distributions. In the first one, I have a mean reward of 0.2, and I have a very narrow variance, so 0 0.05. So this is a uh, reward function that is relatively high and also relatively non-risky, so very um, reliable. However, we only have three samples to estimate it. The second action, there's a, an average reward of 0.15, which is a bit lower. There's a variance, uh, sorry, standard deviation of 0.12, so a bit riskier, but we have 100 samples to estimate it. So we'll, we'll, we will be more certain about our estimation of these parameters. And in the third action, I have a uh, average reward of 0.2, so fairly high, but the standard deviation is 0.5. So this is a very high risk action, and we have 100 samples to estimate it. So I ran the code, and so we get in the output uh, action zero, which is action one, uh, action one and action two. So action zero, we have an estimated mean of 0.12, standard deviation of the estimate of the mean 0.1 and the estimate of the standard deviation of the reward function is 0.14. This gives a conviction of 8.83. On action one, which is action two in the previous slide, we estimated a, a conviction of 44.93. And then on action three, we have a conviction of 2.09. So in other words, based on this formula and this methodology, with, presented with something like this, it would choose the second action, even though its estimated mean is a bit lower, because its risk is relatively much lower than action three. So for, you lose 0 0.05 in terms of potential reward, but you gain much more in terms of, uh, the, well, the opposite of risk. <laughs> Right, so by reducing risk by much more compared to what you gain or lose in uh, expected reward. And the reason why number one was not selected is that there's so much uncertainty in that estimate that it could be, the mean could really be anywhere between like zero and uh, 0.5 or something like that. So the proof of concept code can be found there. So one of the, the big problem that I'm facing right now with this idea 
is that doing a on the fly Bayesian estimation every time you do a lookup is very slow, right? It takes a few seconds every time, so it's not really a viable approach. I will need to figure out a better mechanism so that it can do a Bayesian estimation, but without doing it every time we look up a state. Okay, so that's, that's it for my presentation. Uh, this is my blog, and uh, so I will talk about more about these ideas on my blog if you're interested, and uh, thank you for listening. Questions, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, the goal is to, should, <laughs> so the goal is to speed things up in terms of data efficiency, not in terms of computational efficiency so much. Um, now it's true that using Bayesian methods will slow things down. Um, now there might be better ways, more efficient ways to do it. That's kind of the current problem I'm facing. I'm thinking of maybe using Gaussian processes or something like that. But um, to go back to the original question, it's the, the purpose of episodic control is really more about 